much better rather than these online classes where you, everything is hearsay everything is what you hear and possibly what you see on your laptop it doesn't make so much of an impression where it comes to absorbing the subject but if you actually see the machine in front of you then you will be able to because this answer what are the components operated by the camshaft almost everybody has missed out air starting or the distributor arrangement that has been stopped and a second one that has been missed out is the exhaust valve operating valve actuator if you remember studying about the exhaust valve there is an actuator which provides the hydraulic pressure to open the exhaust valve but that actuator is run by a cam you look back into your exhaust valve diagram and you'll see a cam and this cam is operated by a camshaft so the hydraulic valve hydraulic exhaust valve hydraulically operated exhaust valve is also operated by your camshaft nobody mentioned it what they wrote was inlet valve outlet valve ex sorry inlet valve exhaust valve and fuel injector how is the fuel injector operated by the cam it uh, sort of goes against my ever thinking i have mentioned such a thing it is a fuel pump which is operated by the fuel cam maybe those answers tips do not belong to you maybe they belong to some other campus but it's quite strange that boys are still making mistakes like they don't know what is operated by the cam and camshaft of an engine as a revision since all the boys oh almost everybody is here so 36 and there are 38 boys here so this should be 40 the total of four i don't remember how many with all of them anyway we are more or less everybody is here so let us start our classes and the last class that you had was on lubrication basic marine lubrication and as a revision what were the three areas that we had looked into one was we all got to understand that the lubricating oil and its lubricating system is much like your blood system in your own body they comes kastavya singh so it is much like your blood system in your own body so any problem that arises in your own body will be indicated in the blood and the doctor will tell you to check up or do for a blood test and he will identify your problems similarly your engines where they have lubricating oil that lubricating oil can be considered as their blood and blood system so if the engine fails it will be on account of that blood quality being of a poor level so that is one thing that you learned the second thing that you learned was the good what was the functions of the lube oil i remember there were seven functions which you need to have at your fingertips these seven functions are the function that can be told by an engineer but if you ask a layman what is the purpose of a lubricating oil he will tell you to lubricate to reduce friction and that's all his understanding of a lubricant in a machine exists you as an engineer will need to state all the seven functions that a lubricating oil performs in the engine i am not going to go over them now you should be able to write it on a piece of paper without referring to your earlier notes okay and the third thing that we learned was a good practices in marine lubricant handling on board the ship one was use the correct grade or the correct choice of the lubricant for the machine it is intended for in other words the main engine oil is not the same as your crank is your generator oil and then generator oil is not the same as your compressor oil compressor oil is not the same as your mooring winch oil so all the machines have their respective lubricating oils which are completely different from each other they differ in each in various ways some of them differ chemically some of them differ physically some of them di differ in their viscosity index 
That means the temperatures at which they are responsible for working. So you need to make the correct choice when you're choosing a lubricating oil for a particular machine. You can't afford to make a mistake. You use the wrong quality of oil and you will destroy that machine. This is one. Number two, too much oil in a machine is as bad as too little. There are phone calls coming in. Who's calling? Nobody. Um, too much oil in a machine is as bad as too little oil. So most machines, you will see where they have a container of their own, will have a level gauge. So there will be a high level and low level markers to indicate to you how much oil has to be there in that system. See, if you go check the oil in an engine of a car, they have a dipstick. All right. And if you remove the dipstick, at the end of the stick, you will see marks. Two marks are there. These two marks are indicative of the low level and the high level. So your oil level has to be in between. You cannot exceed the high level and you cannot go below the low level. Both ways, it is a damaging factor. So first one is correct choice. Second one is correct feed. That means the quantity of oil you're giving must be of the correct value. OK, so third good practice is periodic testing of that lubricating oil. You need to take a sample of that oil and send it to the laboratory and to check that everything is in good order, that the oil can continue to be used, or if the report is bad, you will have to change the oil. Apart from this, that oil which you send for testing will also indicate to you the ailments of that particular engine. If some part of the engine is wearing out faster than what it should, it will be indicated in that lubricating oil. So it is a very good means of diagnosis of engine faults. And till today, this procedure is still being used. In spite of all the automation, they still go through oil testing in laboratories. They have very advanced techniques of testing lubricating oils, much like the very advanced techniques of testing your blood in the laboratory. So they can give you a lot of information. All right. The fourth thing that you learned was the main engine lubricating oil system. You need to have that system also at your fingertips. Anytime you're told to draw a lubricating oil diagram of a main engine, you'll be able to draw. And the relevant parts of that diagram were one was a circuit which continued with the lubricator to the tank, lubricator to the tank, sorry, lube oil purifier to the tank and back. So it is like the kidney of your own system, blood system. So the lube oil purifier works or functions like a kidney for the main engine. It continuously purifies the oil. As the oil keeps getting dirtied, it keeps getting cleaned out also. See, so similar to our blood system. OK, let's go back to our, uh, how do I close this? OK, let's go back to where we left off. I think page 9. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was telling you about the three different directions, the three different circuits. One was lube oil purifier to some to lube oil purifier. Then the other one was the main lube oil pumps taking oil from the sump, giving it to various places in the engine and coming back. A third one was you could send the oil to the dirty oil tank, either through the pump or through the purifier. And once it is there in the dirty oil tank, you can continuously clean that oil in that dirty oil tank. And then once it is cleaned, you can put that oil back into your sump. This is an emergency operation in case the situation makes it so required. All right. Now, uh, the other point is, yes, that turbocharger. That turbocharger has a special arrangement for bearing lubrication. The, when the engine is suddenly stopped, if there is a blackout, your generator fails, obviously everything will stop. Everything means your auxiliary engines will stop, your pumps will stop, your main engine will stop. The only thing that will keep running is your 
turbocharger rotor because it is like a free wheeling machine you stop the engine you stop the lubber pump but the rotor will keep rotating on its own momentum is something like your fan you switch off the fan the fan doesn't stop instantly it keeps rotating so the bearings are still in use and the bearings are having their normal friction so this requires lubrication so to enable this lubricating oil to flow to the bearings you have an overhead tank that overhead tank remains full as long as the pump is running as the pump stops whatever is left in the tank starts draining out to the bearings of the turbocharger and that quantity of oil in the tank is more than adequate to keep supply oil to the bearings for about 20 minutes to half an hour so that takes care of the bearings of the turbocharger they don't need to run dry okay the main engine lube oil purifier takes suction from the main engine lube oil pump and purifies the oil its peak temperature is maintained around 75 to 80 degrees i would say 75 to 80 degrees centigrade as maximum maximum density difference is achieved at that temperature to allow for efficient separation of water and oil solids and oil any debris and oil even carbon and oil the separation has to be there so ultimately you get clean oil from one passage and the dirt is the solid dirt settles inside the liquid dirt or water is discharged the engine lube oil must be tested frequently in order to determine whether or not it is fit for service that is one reason why you send that oil to the laboratory to check whether this oil can be used further or it has to be changed samples should be taken from the circulating oil and not directly from the sump tank in other words you take a sample which is in continuous circulation not simply take a what is stagnant okay if you have any questions do not hesitate to put it down in that chat column so we have 38 boys so another i think two boys will be withdrawn isn't it let me have a look once uh section c paran are you there or kundan kumar who is there yes sir okay uh, how many withdrawn cadets you have in this section sir two oh that means you got 100% attendance yes sir oh okay, very good that's good um, so i hope you are absorbing this part of the syllabus well because it is very very crucial not only in terms of your examination but in terms of you as becoming an engineer understanding the principles on processes required in a machine very very critical this particular part of the subject is very critical okay next part what we have is the main engine lube oil sump tank see main engine sump is dry in other words it does not hold any oil there is a passage below the sump which leads to a separate tank and this is only for the main engine it is not sir to allow sufficient separation please explain again okay see once you have the oil heated to a certain temperature its specific gravity is also reduced all right the specific gravity changes take place so that the water and the oil difference is at its maximum and this helps both to separate in the purifier when there is a centrifugal force applied to the combination when you have a combination of the two the water will come to the extreme periphery because its density is much more than the oil the oil at 75 to 80 degree centigrade is ideal because that time the specific gravity will be at a much reduced level than what it is at a low temperature at the same time you cannot raise the temperature above 80 degrees then what happens then it will start possibly oxidizing it will start carbonizing at the initial stages 
and the volatile constituents of the oil will start evaporating. So that is why it is raised to as high a temperature as it can without damaging the lubricating oil. And that helps to reduce the specific gravity of the oil as much as possible in comparison to water. Bigger the difference in the two specific gravities, better the separation. All right. If you heat that oil any further above 80 degrees, then what happens? Then the volatile, it starts more or less evaporating the volatile constituents of the lubricating oil. So that is also damaging. We don't want that to happen. We want to retain the lubricating oil as it is as lubricating oil. But at the same time, we want to have the best separation from the oil and the debris and solids and carbon, whatever is there. Okay, so that helps in making that oil as uh, a specific gravity is low. Also, the viscosity is reduced. If the viscosity is reduced, then what happens? The particles which are there in that oil will immediately move out from that low viscous oil. But if that oil is very viscous, then the chances on the restriction to movement of the particles in the oil is much more. That's the whole idea. That is why you need to raise the temperature in the lubricating oil 75 to 80. That is the standard temperature. There will be manufacturers who will say, do not raise it above 70 degrees. Why? Because they have certain chemicals in that oil which may boil off, which may evaporate, which may oxidize, which may get damaged. So you need to follow the manufacturer specifications also when you are using lubricating oils which have certain chemicals in them. Modern lubricating oils has umpteen number of chemicals in them. And they are so advanced in their technology that you need to handle those oils very carefully when it comes to heating. Otherwise, the additives in the oil are what provide some enhanced properties. And those enhanced properties are not available in an ordinary simple mineral oil. So that is why the temperature control in the purifier has become very, very strict in the modern oils. It wasn't so much when in the 70s and 80s we were using pure mineral oil. That means the oil which has been made from the crude oil without any additives in it. It was pure mineral oil. And that pure mineral oil was being used in the crankcase. But now that pure mineral oil also has antioxidation additives. It has anti-corrosion additives. And these are very, very complex chemicals. And I will give you this chart of chemicals that are there, but you don't need to learn it. It is only to give you an awareness how much technology improvement has come into lubricating oil. Enormous. And that is why your engines of today are capable of giving more and more and more power for the same size of the engine. Because in spite of more power and power and higher temperatures, that lubricating oil is the key component in enabling the movement inside that engine. Otherwise, that lubricating oil will not survive in the high temperatures, high stress, high friction, high movement, things like that. So there has been enormous research and improvement in these oils. And these oils have to be handled very carefully when you're passing it through the purifier. Okay, this is, uh, you, you must go into the Society of Automotive Engineers website and they will give you enormous amount of information for lubricating oils for machinery. If you are interested, you can start writing a technical paper. It's a good subject to write, very relevant to technology. See, design of engines, design of valves, design of crankshaft, these are progressing. But along with this, you need to have progress in the quality of the lubricant or the medium which is helping to run these components at such high stress levels. So that lubricating oil has to be able to sustain very high stress levels. Okay, so let's move on. So the main engine lube oil thumb tank is a separate tank, not like your auxiliary engine. In the auxiliary engine, the sump contains the oil. 
in the auxiliary engine you also have provision for running a purifier that purifier is a much smaller purifier but engineers as a precaution we don't run that purifier when the engine is running we run it when the engine is stopped there have been very frequent cases of that overflow of that lube oil purifier and ultimately 300 liters of oil can vanish in 2 minutes if that purifier is drawing oil is in 2 to 5 minutes all the oil will have overflowed so we don't take chances with running that purifier when the auxiliary engine is running we run it only when the engine is stopped and somebody is keeping a watch on it almost continuously it don't have to be there but nothing can happen to the main to that auxiliary engine if the oil overflows then because it is stopped so that is why we run that purifier only when the auxiliary engine is stopped but for the main engine while right through the voyage 24/7 that purifier has to keep running it is absolutely like a kidney of the human body okay a sounding pipe to know the level of the lube oil in the sump is provided along with the sounding pipe for coffer dam to know if there is any leakage now the lube oil sump tank neighbor is the coffer dam which is a void space and if you need to know what is the void space it is like a passage right along the entire rectangular path of the main engine sump tank and this coffer dam is about the width of your shoulder this very narrow only one person can go in at a time and it is barely two and a half feet in height because the sump tank is also barely two and a half feet in height and the sump tank at the bottom does not touch the hull of the ship there is a clearance between that it is not that when the ship runs the ground the sump tank will also get damaged so the sump tank is barely two and a half maximum 3 feet in depth and the coffer dam will be identical in depth as the sump tank and it is about the width of your shoulder you can just about walk in or crawl in through the sump tank right around and check whether there is any oil leakage from the neighboring tank but it does have a sounding pipe of its own so you need to take the sounding of the coffer dam to check if there is any oil there normally it should be no oil completely dry and clean absolutely clean not a trace of oil should be there but if the wall gets ruptured or fractured or broken or corroded and the oil leaks into the coffer dam you have a problem you have to check for that the coffer dam needs to be inspected on regular basis to know any signs of leakages yes what i told you about the main engine lube oil sump tank consists of a level gauge sounding pipe air vent pipe heating steam coil manholes with covers suction pipes with valves for lube oil pump and lube oil purifiers now i will tell you a very interesting see now this this is the lube oil sump tank and i think i had half repeatedly on how important it is not to have water in the lubricating oil i don't know if i have spoken to this section or the previous section there are six sections so what i have told each section sometimes i can't recall okay okay we come to that story later it was a major major mishap on the ship and we nearly destroyed that main engine just because negligence by one junior engineer so you have to be very careful about this main engine lube oil sump tank consists of a level gauge sounding pipe air vent pipe steam heating coil manholes with covers that is to enter into the tank if it is required to be inspected suction pipe with valves for lube oil pump and lube oil purifiers so if you are asked what are the additional equipment which are fitted for the lube oil sump tank of a main engine you have your answers okay now the steam heating coil is another area for which is prone to risk the steam heating coils from the inside there is water 
and on the outside there is lubricating oil all right because there are coils inside the sump tank now corrosion is inevitable if they are stagnant over a period of time and more often than not you don't need to open the steam when the engine is running because the oil is hot as it is so you don't need to open the steam but there is condensate there is water inside so the possibility of corrosion is very high and these are mild steel pipes they are not extraordinary pipes mild steel pipes so corrosion happens and next time if at all you open steam you are not only passing steam through the pipe just passing steam and water into the lube oil sump so your lube oil is going to get contaminated with water so because of this risk engineers on board the ships never open steam to the sump tank on the contrary they put fit a blank between the flanges to ensure that nobody inadvertently also opens the steam into that tank not even by mistake if the pipes are corroded it is going to hell is going to break loose that is why we don't open steam to the sump tank it is there the provision is there and it is required mostly when the ship is in very cold climate something like leningrad stalingrad murmansk norway sweden north atlantic canada bay of biscay and above so these areas when the ship is there it is freezing cold and sometimes your engine heat may not be able to keep the engine warm engine room warm and you will find yourself wearing jackets inside the engine room in places like north atlantic norway sweden these areas in spite of the engine running you will be wearing jackets in the engine room so it is so cold in places like that you will need to have steam heating almost everywhere inside your cabin inside the engine room inside the control room everywhere so it is not that engine room is always hot there are times when it is freezing inside i had an example when we had gone to germany in bremerhaven and our sea water valve got choked with ice and our engine got overheated because no sea water was able to pass through for cooling so when we opened the cover we dug out that ice from the filter and when the water started coming we quickly put it back then the water started flowing but the ice that we dug out from the filter and put it on the floor pit on the bottommost platform in the engine room remained ice for the next 5 days after 5 days when we came to maneuver the engine we saw that ice still in the form of ice it still hadn't melted and this is inside the engine room you understand so it is not always a hot place to be in sometimes it's a very cold place to be in also and you need to make sure your boiler is working well your steam is being generated to the required quantity because everywhere you'll be requiring steam heating for your accommodation for your control room for your engine room everywhere you will need steam heating steering gear room steering gear room is another place that become very freezingly cold and you have an arrangement to keep that place warm so that the oil over there does not become excessively cold and viscous because there is no heating arrangement for the steering gear oil the steering gear oil is working on either rotary steering gears or the four ram hydraulic steering gear this oil if it is very cold it becomes very viscous all right and because of its viscosity being very high the response time for the machines is delayed so you don't get the correct response when operating your steering gear so that is why the steering gear room also has arrangement for heating sometimes the question asked why is the steering gear room provided with heating nobody lives in there nobody stays in there but there is heating arrangement in the steering gear room so the reason is to keep the oil which operates the steering gear warm as warm as possible to ensure good response of the steering gear 
when the viscosity is within certain limits. Okay, but we have gone out of our topic. Okay, the main lubber sum. Okay, this is the main lubber about the main lubber sum. I hope the fellows are finding it a little interesting. I don't want to only simply repeat what is there in the plates. I want to tell you interesting situations that happen on the ship. So you are having some idea of what we can expect on the ship. So it makes a big difference to be a little aware. Now, the turbocharger lubricating oil system, the turbocharger bearing lubricating oil system can be completely separate from the main engine lube oil system, or it can be fed through the main engine lubricating oil system. That means it can have its own containers at the bearings for lubricating the bearings, or it can have the lube oil system from the main engine like the one I showed you like the one I showed you in that earlier diagram of the main engine lube oil system. Okay. And it depends on the design. I've been on both and I will say it is 50-50. About 50% of the ships I've been on, they have got the main engine lube oil system and 50% of them have got their own containers. And these containers have to be frequently changed after every 500 hours or so, especially the turbine side. The oil on the turbine side, it gets oxidized very quickly. Why? Because it is exposed to much higher temperature. The exhaust gases pass through the turbine. But on the blower side, if the temperature is not so high, so the oil lasts much longer. In the turbine side, the oil gets darkened. It becomes dark color. So it is actually getting oxidized and it becomes thicker. So we need to change that oil every 500 hours. That oil, when we remove, it goes into the sludge tank. That is the catch in today's world. In today's modern world, what do you do with the old oil? Similarly, when you change the oil of an engine, what do you do with that oil? In my time, we used to take out that oil and put it in the double bottom tank with the heavy oil. All right. Now, 500 tons, 500 tons of heavy oil and 300 liters of lube oil did not make much of a damage to the main engine oil, to the heavy oil, because that oil is now going to pass through the purifier. So if there is any dirt in that lubricating oil, it will get separated in the heavy oil purifier. So we used to use the waste lube oil in the heavy oil and burn it in the main engine and everything was fine. Today, that is banned. You cannot mix your waste lube oil in your heavy oil. Earlier, we could do it and it is a very convenient way of getting rid of unwanted oil. Understand? 300 liters of oil every 3000 hours from the generator has to be changed. Now we take out that oil and what do we do with it? So we used to put it into the double bottom tank having heavy oil. That heavy oil is to mix with the lube oil and then ultimately we used to pump it to the settling tank. Settling tank used to drain out whatever sludge and water was there and then pass it through the heavy oil purifier. The purifier is to clean up that oil and put it into the service tank. So 300 liters of lubricating oil in 500 tons of heavy oil made no distinction. In fact, the lubricating oil has had, having a much higher calorific value than the heavy oil. But 300 liters doesn't make a difference. But it was a very convenient way of getting rid of waste lube oil. Similarly, for the turbocharger, every 500 hours, you have to remove 2-3 liters of that oil. And then what do you do with it? We have to put it into the slush tank. There also that oil could have been put with the heavy oil and burnt out with the main engine or with the boiler. When you're firing the boiler, you simply need heat. So it is not extraordinary performance of the boiler that is affected. You can burn that fuel as fuel for combustion chamber in the boiler and generate steam. So we could use that. But today's world, it is banned. You cannot do that. At least not for main engine heavy oil. 
why i told you some time back that lubricating oils in today's world are highly evolved evolved meaning they are capable of doing much more than what an ordinary lubricating oil can do how can they do it because they have a lot of chemicals in them and very complex chemicals these chemicals enhance the ability of that lubricating oil to perform under enormous stress enormous high temperatures and similar situations so when you mix that lubricating oil with the heavy oil those additives or chemicals also mix with the heavy oil and these additives sometimes do not burn they will form special grades of salts if they are exposed to very high temperature so when you burn it in the main engine these chemicals will burn to form salts oxide deposits which will settle inside the engine exhaust valve turbine blades and injectors fuel pump everything will get damaged because burning these additives is a complex process it is quite unlike burning it in the boiler so in the boiler also if you burn it on the combustion chamber possibly on the burner nozzle deposits can take place from these additives from these chemicals and ultimately they will go about damaging your equipment so you cannot use waste lube oil into your heavy oil all right this is normally a question asked of you in your oral you will not find a question like this coming in your written exams but in your oral exam you will come how will you get rid of your waste lube oil from your auxiliary engine your gear box your uh, turbocharger if at all they have a separate lubricating oil so these are solutions which were there earlier but right today you cannot you have to put them in a collecting tank or a sludge tank this sludge oil will have to be delivered to shore barges in port after paying a certain fee so it has become very very strict about getting rid of waste lube oil or waste fuel oil or sludge it has to be given to shore barges for which you have to make a very substantial payment so it is become a added expenditure for the ship owner okay so the diagram which i had given to you it showed void lube oil to the turbocharger when the engine is stopped but the lube oil pumps are running it consists of an overhead tank filled with oil from lube oil pumps a pipe from the bottom of the tank with an orifice plate leads to the turbocharger bearings and thereafter to the sump tank the orifice plate allows flow at a lesser rate than the filling pipe thus an overflow outlet pipe at the top allows the excess oil collected to return to the sump tank as the rotor of the turbocharger continues to rotate for some time even after the engine is stopped it requires oil for the bearings i hope this is one concept that is very very clear to you the oil tank ensures this even if the engine and pump have stopped or tripped inadvertently that is why they put a question to you during exams next part what we deal with is what are the contaminants found in the system oil of a two stroke propulsion engine that means what are the impurities found number 1 is water and water will be there even if there is no leakage rather fresh water will be there even if there is no leakage from any part but water will be there where will this water be coming from madhav kumar where will this water come be coming from madhav kumar has gone into hibernation yes sir ah where in in your luboil some mm. there will always be little water in spite of there being no leakage from any of the components so where does this water come from make a guess i don't expect you to be giving a uh, 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 professor chief engineer's answer because this is a learning process so we need to get doubts cleared we need to make mistakes and then we need to correct those mistakes 
So it doesn't matter what your answer is, but what do you feel? Where do you think this water is coming from? Sir, from heat exchangers. From detex. Heat exchangers, sir. No, 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 no. Not from the heat exchangers. Because just now I told from you. the condensation of air. Ah, there you are. Right. Absolutely right. That's good. That's good. It is coming from the condensation of air. You see, our ships, when they travel along the equatorial belt of the globe, it is very humid, very humid. In fact, every time you go to the engine room and you come up after four hours, you'll find your whole boiler suit is wet. It is absolutely wet. And if you're working, you can come out with the boiler suit and squeeze out the sweat from it. It becomes so wet. If the humidity levels are so high in some parts of the globe, it's and over time you will get used to it. No big deal. So this air which is there in the engine room is also very humid. So when there is sudden cooling, either the oil comes into the tank because the tank is also getting partly cooled from the hull. So when the hot comes into the colder tank, there is some condensation of the air that is around it. So this condensed water or vapor from the air comes into the tank as water. That is why I keep harping that if your ship or engine is stopped for a period, long period of time, you might be warming it up and keeping it warm, etc. The sump tank will always get accumulated water. And before you start your lube oil pump, it is very, very crucial to start your lube oil purifier. Moment you come to the engine to start the engine, first thing you must start is the lube oil purifier. Why? Because whatever has condensed and the oil inside that sump tank is stagnant because the pump is not running. It is stagnant. So the water that condenses will gradually come to the bottom and go to that corner where I showed you in that tank, it has got an increased depth as compared to the forward end. So the, the bell mouth suction pipe of the purifier is right there. And the first thing that it will pick up from the tank is that water. So that is why it is crucial to run the purifier first and then observe the purifier, whether it is delivering oil or it is delivering water. So initially there will be some water coming out, which is a blessing. And once the water stops coming, you know that the water has been removed. And next you will see the flow of the oil coming in satisfactorily. It is passing through the heater and then again going back into the tank. So the entire sump tank oil gets heated gradually. After two, three hours of running of your lube oil purifier, you can start your lube oil pump. That is the time your pump will draw only oil and not water. So that only oil is circulated through the engine and no water. If by chance there is water in the sump and you come and start the lube oil pump first, what will happen? There is every chance of water and oil both being drawn and circulated through the engine. And that will form an emulsion. It will damage your lube oil, it will damage your engine. So it is very crucial to ensure that there is no water in the sump by operating your lube oil purifier first and foremost before starting lube oil pump or engine. Of course, you can't start the engine before unless you start the lube oil pump. But before starting lube oil pump, start the lube, lube oil purifier. Remember this all your life till your chief engineer and beyond. Then you will see your engine will be in a good health at all times. Okay, so water can be seawater also. This seawater, where will it come from? Mother? Yes, sir. Where does the seawater come from? Sir, heating steam coil leakage, sir. Heating steam coil Steam is not made out of seawater. Steam is made out of fresh water. You don't put seawater in the boiler. Steam heating coils will have fresh water. I'm asking you, where does the seawater come into main engine sump from? Do a little thinking. I'm not insisting that you give me the correct answer. 
I want to discuss with you because one of the reasons is that if I only keep talking, I start feeling sleepy. I need to have a conversation with you. I need to have an interactive session with you. That is why I hate these online classes. I'd rather be in class with you where I can actually interact with you, tell you a few stories about on the ship and be able to make it much more interesting and interactive. Here in front of a laptop, I can't see any or any one of you. I'm just talking, 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 talking. You must be also getting fed up. So I need that conversation with you, even if it is uh, whatever you say is not right, doesn't matter. So I need to have that conversation. So tell me, where does the seawater come from? Try again. Sir, leaking jacket water. Um, no, uh, leaking jacket water is also fresh water. You tell me the two places first where seawater is used for cooling. And the reason is the product has to be 40 degrees centigrade after cooling. One is the lubricating oil. All right. Number two is the air which is coming from the from the turbocharger, after, from the blower rather, from the blower when it enters the cooler, it is around 130 degrees centigrade. So to bring that air temperature from 130 to 40 degrees, you need something colder than 40 degrees centigrade, isn't it? So you use seawater. Sea water at the maximum is about 31 degrees centigrade. So the 31 degrees centigrade is used to cool air which is coming at 90 degrees centigrade. So that is how you get 40 degrees air after the cooler. And that air is fed into the engine. Okay. So that is one. If the air cooler leaks and seawater goes into that air system, then that seawater will go into the cylinder. But here I am worried about the lubricating oil getting seawater. Where can it get? It's a very, very interesting situation. And I'm going to actually explain it to you through a real experience on board. And it should remain with you always. But if I simply read out what is there on the screen and go on to the next plate, it is most boring. Most boring. So seawater is used in two places on the main engine. One is for the air cooling because you need the air at 40 degrees centigrade. And seawater is 31 degrees centigrade. So it is capable of cooling that hot air coming from the turbocharger from 130 degrees to 40 degrees. So that is why seawater is used. Next, number two is your lubricating oil. The lubricating oil which is coming out from the main engine is about 65 to 70 degrees centigrade. And it comes to the sump tank, it remains at 65 degrees centigrade. Then you remember the diagram. The lube oil pump draws it and pulls it through the filter and then it goes to the heat exchanger, the lube oil cooler. The inlet to the cooler is 65 degrees centigrade, outlet is 40 degrees centigrade. So how will you cool that oil from 65 to 40? You have to use seawater. That is the coolest item available out at sea. Okay. So that seawater is used in that heat exchanger. Now, the next interesting part is the lubricating oil which is going into that cooler is going at 4 to 6 bar or 4 to 6 kg per centimeter squared. Okay. But the seawater which is coming in is going at 2 to maximum 2.8 or 3 bar, 3 kg per centimeter squared. So in that heat exchanger, you have one side the seawater is flowing and it is at 2.5 to 2.8 kg per centimeter squared. The lubricating oil which is entering at the bottom, let me show you the diagram. Yeah, this is the lube oil cooler, all right. The seawater is entering from the bottom here and because there is a baffle plate, it has to go through the tubes inside and then make a U-turn from there and then it comes out from here and goes out. So the seawater is entering at 30, 31 degrees centigrade. The hot fluid, that means the lubricating oil is entering from the bottom and it fills up this space and there is a baffle plate here. So it has to take a high jump and go over the baffle plate and then it comes here. And then again, it has to go under the baffle plate, come out from here, another high jump, 
So in other words, the lubricating has to make contact with all the tubes before it can go out at 40 degrees centigrade. Okay. Now this lube oil pressure is at 4 to 6 bar, whereas the seawater pressure is 2.5 to 3 bar or 3 kg per centimeter square. Now, if there is a damage in the pipes or the fitting of the pipe in the plates, which fluid is going into the other? Other? Sir, lube oil will go. Sea Absolutely. Water. Correct. That is right. The lube oil will go into the seawater. And this is what happens on the ship because you cannot see anything. And then suddenly the captain gets a call on the VHF at 2 o'clock in the night that, Captain, you are discharging oil into the sea. So captain gets a shock of his life. And then the captain calls the chief engineer. Chief, are you discharging oil into the sea? Say, no. So chief engineer reached some the engine home. Junior engineer, fourth engineer, are you pumping out bilges? No, sir. Are you pumping out sludge tank? No, sir. Are you pumping out any tank? No, sir, nothing. We are only keeping watch. Where is the oil going out from? It becomes a big problem. How did they find out at 2 o'clock in the night when everything is dark? You see, there are satellites in the sky from for every country which has got a coastline. And that, those satellites are monitoring the surface of the sea in the vicinity of their coastline. And they are capable of detecting oil on the surface through these satellites. And they will trace that oil, which is which will be in a long line, of course. And they will trace that oil to a particular ship. And they will identify that ship by its longitude and latitude location. And immediately inform that harbor master that this particular ship in such and such position has a long line of oil coming from its uh, path in its wake. So then the harbor will find out which ship is in this particular area and then will find out, oh, motor vessel so and so. So they will immediately get the IMO number and immediately get the contact number and then call up on the VHF. Captain, you are pumping out oil. Captain gets a shock. How is it? So that is the one of the main crises that is going around on old ships. So the lube oil purifier has to be frequently checked for leakages. And how do you check it? While the, uh, while the cooler is in operation, you will notice there are two little valves, two small little valves. One is on top and one is at the bottom on the end cover. All right. This end cover is covering the passage for the seawater. All right. Now, if the lubricating oil leaks, if it, there is a leakage between the tube fitting, the tubes are fitted into the plate. And this plate, if it leaks, what happens? The oil will float right to the top because oil is lighter than water. And this little pocket over here will be full of oil. And the water will be flowing out, no doubt. But little bit of oil will be collected here at this corner. So the best way is to open that top slightly and purge it. Purge it means take out the air. But in the process, there will be some amount of fluid coming out. And if that fluid has any oil in it, your cooler is leaking. Your cooler is leaking. This pocket must be free of any oil. Are you able to understand? Yes, sir. Yes. And this a little uh, yeah, plug, uh, this little uh, uh, cock, it is, it's a small little cock, is a very crucial element in the detection of your lube oil cooler leakage. It is a question. Sir, dew point is remain same all over the world. Yes, I suppose dew point is common. For fresh water, it will be the same. It is the temperature at which condensation takes place. I think it's about 15 degrees centigrade. Uh, something like that. I don't remember the exact value. But dew point is the same. It is the temperature at which the vapor condenses into liquid. In fact, condensation takes place inside the cylinders also, if there is a change. And this condensation 
gives rise to acid formation from the sulfur dioxide and sulfur trioxide that is within the cylinder. It is same around the world. I frankly, I'll have to check it out. I can't give you a direct answer. Dew point is remain same all over the world. I can't give you a direct answer. I will. I'll try to figure it out. I don't know. All over the world. Oh, might be different in Iceland. Might be different in India. Sir, if jacket water heat of main engine is not working in colder region, how would warm jacket of main engine? See, if the engine is running on full load, no problem. If you are going through the fords of Norway, you have to go slow power. And slow power means less heat generation. Less heat generation means lower temperature. It all depends on how much engine load is there in those closed climates. And in those cold climates, because it is not a vast sea, there are some narrow passages also you have to go through. So the engine cannot be put on full load. If the engine is put on full load, means more heat generation and it is much easier. But there are times when you have to go through passages which require the engine to go slowly. If the engine is going slowly, it is burning lesser fuel, which means lesser heat generation, which means a cold engine room. Then what you need to do is start firing the boiler. So when your ship is traversing through narrow passages or coastline, it is not generating enough heat by the main engine. So you will need to start firing the boiler. And that boiler steam is then used for heating up the jacket cooling water tank, which is an overhead tank. And you need to crack open the steam in those tanks. And you know, you don't need to open the, I have noticed this thing, anywhere you give heating, you don't need to open the valve, you need to crack open the valve, just little bit, maybe one tenth of an inch opening of the valve from the seat. It is enough to give heating for the entire tank. It is like that. Opening steam does not mean open all the valve fully. Just crack open, that is enough, because you want steam to go in, in a way where the outlet will be a condenser. In other words, all the heat from the steam has to be utilized for heating. So when it is used, what comes out should be condensed. You don't want steam to go in and steam to come out when you're wasting fuel. That's how warm jacket of main engine. So you have to use, start firing your boiler. And we have done it. We have done it on board the ship and it had become necessary when you are passing very cold climates. Okay. Okay, we have done this. What was the last? We have done this also. Yeah, this was the one. So your seawater can come into your lubricating oil system. But how? Because the pressure of lube oil is 4 bar and pressure of steam is 2. Now, now pay attention to this. When your ship has come into harbor, it has stopped. Engine has stopped. Okay. After about half an hour, you stop your lube oil pump. Half an hour to 45 minutes, you stop your lube oil pump. You never shut off your lube oil pump as soon as the engine has shut down. You have to keep your lube oil pump running because the components inside the engine are still very hot. So that lube oil is used for cooling and that lube oil goes into the sump. So once you stop your lube oil pump, what is the pressure? Zero. The lube oil pressure then is zero. And it is no problem because your engine has been shut down. You switch off your seawater pump also and main seawater pump has to be switched on. But your auxiliary engines are running, but then seawater is necessary for cooling the cooling water, which is used for cooling those generators. So you have to start your harbor seawater pump. Harbor seawater pump, main seawater pump, ballast pump, fire pump, all these pipelines are common pipelines because they are all having seawater in them. All right. So even if you switch off your seawater pump, 
and start your harbor sea water pump your harbor sea water pump is enough to cool the fresh water which is heating up or rather cooling the main auxiliary engine all right so when you switch off your sea water pump what is the pressure in the sea water line it is never zero in fact even if you switch off the harbor sea water pump also the pressure is still not zero why you see the ship is immersed in water and inside the engine room you are actually below the water level which is outside the ship okay so this head pressure is always there in the pipelines inside the engine room so at any time even if you switch off the sea water pump you when you close the valves somewhere some through you will see from the overboard discharge pipe there is a pressure and you cannot afford to open any valve or any plug on the sea water line it is under significant amount of pressure at all times at all times okay so now the cooler that i showed you just now had sea water entering and going out it had lube oil going in and coming out the lube oil pressure is zero all the oil from there drains into your sump tank it will ultimately drain into your sump tank but the sea water remains in those passages of the cooler at the pressure of 1 and 1/2 to 2 bar depends on how much draft the ship has so this pressure of sea water will now start leaking into the lube oil passage and while you are sleeping in your cabin very comfortable because your main engine is off pumps are off you can sleep peacefully the oil, water is leaking into your lube oil line and then next morning when you come and you are going to start your main engine the first thing you are required to do is check how much oil is there in the sump tank and also you have checked the oil after you switched off the lube oil pump yesterday when you stopped the engine that time the oil was 50 cm and today morning when you come and check you find it is gone to 75 cm so where has this oil come from and remember when you lower a sounding tape inside the tank it goes through the oil and then it goes through the water and then it reaches the bottom all right now when you when you withdraw the tape you are taking it out of the water and then that bob truck trip passes through the oil and when it comes out the entire tape with the bob is coated with oil there will be no indication of any water on it so you think that the full tank is full of only oil but that is not the case how can it become from 50 cm to 75 cm where has 25 cm of oil come from that is the time you suspect that sea water has come in and the first thing you will do is start the lube oil purifier and and then watch the purifier you find gushing of water coming out sea water gushes the water coming out you keep it running for one and a half two hours until the 75 cm again comes back to 50 cm when it comes back to 50 cm then you will see no more water coming out of your lube oil purifier and only oil is coming out that is the time you need to suspect where did that water come from and the only source that can be is from your heat exchanger or lube oil cooler all right madam did you understand what i told you yes sir yes you have to be these are the hazards that you face on the ship and you will have to be very alert in uh what you call diagnosing the fault if you see something you should be able to tell what is the cause of course that will come with a little bit of few one or two years of experience you will be able to identify the cause of the fault by seeing its damage when a uh, when a item is damaged you should be able to tell what is the cause and then eliminate the cause and then do the repair of that particular problem okay so anyway so let we have not finished this plate my goodness so water or sea water is one of the most common contaminants of lubricating oil 
the second contaminant that you see is fuel in the lube oil and this contamination is called dilution the term used for fuel contaminating your oil lubricating oil is called uh, dilution sometimes they say fuel dilution but just saying dilution is enough and this fuel it can come into the lubricating oil because both the oil are working in the vicinity of each other and the most common source of fuel oil leaking into your main engine lube oil is from the in four stroke engines i have had it six or seven times on board the ship just one minute please most common place for fuel oil going into your engine is in the four stroke auxiliary engines it is very very rare in the case of fuel oil going into your main engine sump tank and i have never faced it in my 19 years of sea service 18 19 years of sea service most common is in the four stroke engines why see the cylinder head is the location where you have lubricating oil lubricating the rocker arms and then after it lubricates the rocker arm it falls in through that common passage back into the sump goes way down into the sump okay now in the same region where the rocker arms are you have the fuel injector this fuel injector is fitted with the pipe which comes from the fuel pump okay now fuel injector are regularly required to be serviced in other words every 500 hours or 1000 hours depending on the manufacturer's uh, guidelines you are expected to open that nut which communicates the fuel injector take out that injector take it to the stand pressure test it to see if it is lifting at the correct pressure and whether the atomization of the fuel coming out is satisfactory or not then if it is satisfactory you fit it back and again put that nut this repeated opening and closing of this nut on that pipe work hardens that pipe at that point where the pipe is being held by the nut against the injector every time you open close open close open close then that neck part of that pipe gets work hardened now what is work hardening if a component is repeatedly tapped or hammered that surface becomes harder it becomes brittle it loses its ductility all right an example is if you have a new hammer purchased from the shop and you have an old hammer which has been used for years which surface will be harder obviously the old one so that surface has suffered what is called work hardening if necessary you want to go into details of this write it on a piece of paper beside you and write over there work hardening at a later date check out what it means okay so same thing what happens to this pipe at that neck it becomes work hardened and very brittle now the pressure from the fuel pump is in the region of 300 350 bar to open that injector and inject the oil so each time that pipe is under inflation deflation inflation deflation inflation deflation and this component is also very brittle at that point so the fracture takes place in other words fatigue failure fatigue failure is more common on brittle components than ductile so in that portion it has become very brittle it fractures and the fracture is hairline fracture at you cannot see it impossible and when the pressure of the pump is 350 bar that fracture opens to allow the oil to leak and when the pressure drops it closes so this fracture can only be found out when the engine is running so that is the time with the engine running you are expected to open the cover put your finger along that pipe and see smell it diesel oil has a distinctive smell as compared to lubricating oil so if that you will have to check all the units 
and find out which particular unit is leaking diesel oil. Once you identify, you have to stop the engine, remove that fuel pipe, put a new pipe, and then put it back in action. Then only you can change the oil from the sun. So this is fuel dilution, and it happens mainly in four-stroke engines at the fuel nozzle and fuel injector. In the, the two-stroke propulsion engine, the crankcase oil is different from cylinder heads. It does not happen. What can happen and how fuel can still come into the sump is at the fuel pump. The fuel pump, barrel and plunger, if it leaks, it will fall to the bottom. And bottom means below this particular tray is the camshaft. The camshaft is lubricated by lube oil. So there is possibility of the oil going into the camshaft from the camshaft, it will go into the sump. So to prevent this, you have an umbrella. It's the construction on the plunger of the barrel of the pump, which if there is leakage, the umbrella will divert the flow of the oil to a space from where it can be led out of the engine. It will not go directly through the passage of the plunger into the cam and camshaft with the roller. So this arrangement is made for the fuel pump like an umbrella structure. This umbrella structure diverts the oil outside the passage where it can go into the sump. So these are design improvements which help. The third contaminant that you find is cylinder oil. Cylinder oil for a two-stroke engine is the oil which is used for lubricating the piston and liner. This oil is different in chemical constituents, also physical constituents from the main engine crankcase oil. Now, if this oil finds its way into the main engine lubricating oil, in the main engine lubricating oil, then it is a contaminant because it is going to change the viscosity, it's going to change the alkalinity of that crankcase oil. And that is not what we want. So, cylinder oil coming into the space is a contaminant okay and it comes through the stuffing box you see when the piston and liner are lubricated some oil is coming down to the bottom of the under piston spaces and this under piston spaces has got the stuffing rod uh, stuffing box and the cylinder oil is sometimes vapor sometimes splashing comes onto the piston rod and from the piston rod if your stuffing box glands are not satisfactory it will leak past that rod into the crankcase this will not happen much when the engine is running at slow speed when the engine is running at full speed that is the time maximum amount of oil can come in why why at maximum speed why not at slow speed because the under piston space is used as a pump. So the air pressure under the piston is much more than the pressure inside the crankcase. So the high air pressure and the oil on the surface of the piston rod will push that oil into the crankcase. So there is no way out because you have to maintain higher pressure under the piston so that the under piston space is used like a pump to improve the scavenge pressure. All right. So that is why cylinder oil can get into the crankcase. It is rare for main engine lube oil to come into the cylinder under piston spaces. Yes, it can happen. It can happen that the main engine crankcase oil, which is also splashing on the piston rod, can come up into the under piston spaces. But it is very rare because the pressure in the under piston spaces is much higher than the pressure inside the crankcase. I have a fine question for you. A simple question. What is the ideal pressure inside the crankcase of an engine, any engine, whether it is first stroke, whether it is two stroke? Shitis Jaisal will tell us. Jaswal, 
what is the pressure inside the crankcase of an engine no answer okay madhav yes sir what is the pressure inside the crankcase of an engine ideal pressure See, if you all don't respond i get bored i stay interested because you are interested 2 to 3 bar sir why did you say 2 to 3 bar give me a reason <coughs> sir uh, it would be minimum 5 uh, to 6 bar Ah. Kundan Kumar, tell me what is the ideal pressure inside the crankcase of an engine? See, ideally it should be little less than atmospheric pressure. Ideally, how is it achieved? Inside the crankcase, it is hot air, very hot. Vapor, oil, vapor is there. Oil is splashing. There is oil vapor. a crankcase always has what is called a breather pipe this breather pipe is from the crankcase it goes way 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 up into the funnel and at the funnel it will have a oil a uh, sorry wire mesh this wire mesh is a, like a demister a demister is an obstruction in the flow of a liquid but it allows flow of a vapor or a gas okay so this demister is like a wire mesh it is it stops any oil particles from going out it helps to trap it and if lot of them are trapped it goes back into the crankcase but it allows the air to come out into the spaces so hot air always flows upwards all right so this hot air from the combustion from the crankcase spaces will have a tendency to go up and out so this flow of air continuous helps to keep the pressure in the crankcase low how low marginally below atmospheric pressure now what are they talking about yeah so cylinder oil has a tendency to come into the crankcase because the crankcase is always maintained at a low pressure your under piston spaces will always be at a higher pressure because the air coming from the turbocharger blower first comes into the scavenge manifold from there it does not go directly into the engine it goes to the under piston spaces through a set of scavenge valves these scavenge valves are non return valves they allow flow through only one direction when the piston goes up that air goes into the space under the piston when the piston goes down that air is compressed and it goes through another set of valves to another part of the scavenge manifold which is led directly to the scavenge ports or inlet ports to the engine so it is kundan kumar no class finished hello anybody hear me yes sir yes sir, yes, sir. Oh, okay because i have a blackout in my home there is no power my battery is still running so i'll continue this class maybe oh it is only 10 minutes more let's finish this so that is why cylinder oil can escape into the crankcase ideally crankcase should be little below atmospheric pressure okay so why crankcase is maintained at that pressure why it is maintained because we don't want pressure rise inside the crankcase we need a higher uh, we don't need a high pressure because that is the way you will have an explosion if at all but it doesn't reach that level unless there is the 
crankcase explosion condition. So ideally, it has to be low pressure. And we have a breathing pipe which helps to draw the air out. Why crankcase is maintained at that pressure? Means chances of any explosion is also reduced. And one more important point is, if you have more pressure inside the crankcase, then you see the surface of the engine is leaking oil. Even if you have covers on the surface, there are gaskets and there are maybe 50, 60 different gaskets on the engine keeping the covers in place. If there is pressure inside the crankcase, the oil which is splashing about inside will start seeping out from various parts of the engine. Not for a new engine, for a relatively old engine. And that is what happens on some of my ships when we were working. So the oil from all over the surface of the engine will start leaking out. And this pressure inside the crankcase is suddenly going up. Why? Because there is excessive blow past from the piston rings. This is for a four-stroke engine. So if the piston rings are damaged, the pressure inside the crankcase will become very high. And oil will start seeping out from the surface of the engine. And of course, from the breather pipe, air will be pumping out. It will be coming out in gusts. So in the process, a lot of oil might go out from the breathing pipe. It's a very dangerous situation, very bad, negative, dangerous situation. It is also an indicative of how good your piston rings are. If you are able to maintain pressure in the crankcase little lower than atmospheric. That means no leakage past the piston rings is taking place. Okay. So apart from this cylinder oil, you have carbonaceous products of combustion. That means whatever slight blow past is taking place, all the carbon that comes out will go into that lubricating oil. That is why in the four-stroke engine, you must change the oil after a stipulated number of running hours because that oil is directly exposed to the combustion blow pass gas. In the two-stroke, you don't need to change. Why? Because there's no, there is a very rare instance of blow pass coming into the lubricating oil. Apart from carbonaceous products of combustion, you have insolubles. Insolubles means products we do not dissolve in the oil. That is dust, rust, worn metal particles, ash. These are called insolubles. They are physical components which can be removed by filtration and by centrifuging. Okay. The last contaminant that you find is microbial contamination, which is growth of fungus. This is not common because most of the time the engine is running, ship is running. It is when the ship is not running. If the ship is held in anchorage or in the harbor for a long, long time and the pumps are not running, the tank which is containing the oil ultimately has some water in it. So this water inside the tank with the oil and it is stagnant. That means there is no movement inside. Then you have growth of fungus. And this growth of fungus is at the interface between the water and the oil. Because particles which float on the water are the nucleus for the growth of the fungus. Even if there is one fungus cell, and fungus is there everywhere. If one fungus cell is allowed to settle, it will start growing. It consumes the oil for its growth. The hydrocarbons in that oil is consumed for its growth. And it grows thicker and thicker and thicker and forms a network at the interface between the water and the oil. And then when it becomes heavy, it drops to the bottom. And that time, it does not need any more hydrocarbon. Then what has happened is anaerobic bacterial growth. And this continues over a period of time. The oil gets consumed and it gets damaged. And then the sludge formation at the bottom becomes very heavy, enormous amount. And the oil is destroyed. When you clean the tanks, you will get the smell very distinctively of what rotten eggs are like. 
this sludge is now full of hydrogen sulfide or hydrogen sulfide gas will come out from this sludge if it is cleaned so tank cleaning becomes necessary in tanks where the oil has got micro the oil itself becomes slimy you know what is slimy sticky slimy it's got a distinctive smell discoloration all these things happen in an oil that has got microbial contamination okay so these are the six basic contaminants found in the lubricating oil contamination of lubricating oil by water what are the causes leakage is from cylinder cooling water system yes it is possible if there is a major problem for normal leakages the design is such that if the ceiling rings the leak for the water the passages are led out of the engine so any water that leaks past the ceiling is led out of the engine and it will not go into the crankcase that's all right same thing with piston cooling water system piston cooling water system for water cooled pistons the leakage will take place where the telescopic pipes enter the chamber and continuously are working against the seals these seals if they leak the water that comes out from the seals is again led out of the engine so the chances of water leakage from your jacket cooling or your piston cooling is very rare in the case of two stroke engines in the four stroke engines yes the jacket cooling rings if they leak straight into the crankcase so there is more chances of water leakages in the crankcase of four stroke engine there is very little chance of water leakage from the jacket or the piston in the two stroke engine there is arrangements to allow that water to leak out of the engine not inside the engine okay next is lube oil cooler water leakages yes here the water leakage will be sea water in the previous two in the jacket it will be fresh water similarly for piston cooling it will be fresh water but in the lube oil cooler only when pump uh, leakages can see, can be sea water sw or fresh water only when the pump is running now fresh water if the modern some of the ships have fresh water cooling and those instead of using sea water for the cooler they have a gigantic cooler where a lot of fresh water is cooled by the sea water so this fresh water is then used like sea water for your air cooler as well as for your lube oil cooler i have not seen any of these type of ships but there are ships which have an extra large fresh water cooler there you have sea water cooling the fresh water and that fresh water is used for jacket cooling it is used for uh, air cooling it is for lube oil cooling so these are different cooling arrangements for jacket water cooling you will have two different temperatures of cooling one is a higher temperature one is a lower temperature it's a little more complicated but we'll come to that much later so these are the sources of lube oil cooler next is leakages from sump tank heating coil just now i told you that some of the sump tank they have steam heating coils and if the steam heating coils are leaking then when you open steam it will leak the water directly into the oil the most common place where you will get water contamination is from the lube oil purifier see lube oil purifier is working on a very thin margin if the gravity disk that you choose is incorrect it will either cause the water to go into the lubricating oil or the lubricating oil going out or overflowing into the water cycle so the engineers don't want to lose the oil so they don't want the oil to go out in the water cycle so they choose a gravity disk which is such that little water may go into the lube oil but oil must not go out of the water side so when the temperature change takes place there is possibility of water going into the lube oil side it is basically choosing the correct gravity disk 
and maintaining the temperature of that lubricating oil at the purifier which will give you the most efficient water removing process from the crankcase oil this last point is very very important i hope you will remember it okay so as of now we'll keep it to this or shall we go into the other one okay let us read this also the 14 uh, uh, page 14 will be the last page for your class today what are the effects of water contamination the effects of water contamination is acid formation in the lube oil for the trunk type of piston engine you see a lot of combustion gas lot nahi some amount of combustion gases is blow pass into the spaces these gases are acidic in nature and now then if you provide water then these acidic gases with the water will form acid and thereby start corroding components within that engine the bearings will get corroded the shafts will get pitting marks and all parts which are exposed to that acidic oil will have corrosion reduction in cooling efficiency once you have water in it there will be some amount of reduction in its cooling efficiency the rate at which the cooling can be done will also be reduced reduction in load carrying capacity of the lubricating oil that mean the film of oil will not be a film of oil will be water oil water oil water oil mixture of water and oil not a not an emulsion yet but there will be traces of water and the bearings will not be able to be separated satisfactorily between the two that viscosity is not being retained as what it should be in that film of oil between the two contacting surfaces so that is why you have a reduction in the load carrying capacity of the lubricating oil reduction in the lube oil properties such as base number previously tbn used to be used now t is no longer used and bn is the term used so the alkalinity of that oil will also be lost if there is water in that oil next is formation of sludge sludge formation will take place at places where there is emulsification and that emulsification will ultimately result in sludge corrosion in various parts of the machinery is without fail it will happen if there is water in the lubricating oil and last but not least microbial degradation of the oil if the oil is stagnant along with the water in any tank this microbial degradation can take place in whether it is lube oil diesel oil heavy oil hydraulic oil any oil any mineral oil you can have microbial degradation once a fungus gets in it starts consuming the hydrocarbon for growth and then slowly slowly it forms a network and destroys the oil so the oil must be kept circulating it must be kept at a certain temperature and it must be free of water if you can maintain these three conditions there will be no microbial contamination okay this will be all for today i am a little tired also so we will call it off as of now and there are 36 boys now what happened to the remaining this is section c so it should be actually 40 so i am finding two boys have done the uh, bunking two boys have bunked classes so now i am going to take att attendance so all 38 are not there so i have to take the attendance makes it a little more interesting other i become tired i become a little sleepy also so let us take the attendance on who are present and this is section c so i show 36 which should have been 40 okay let us start with people uh 798081882 is missing 8082 8384 84 himanish mukherjee are you there yes sir so you are 84 okay jatin 86 is missing who is 86 
कुंदन कुमार शर्मा आर यू एट जीरो कुंदन कुमार आई एट जीरो एट टू और एट जीरो थ्री कुंदन हेलो यस व्हाट इज द नंबर सो वन सो वन जीरो टू सर वन जीरो टू सो वन जीरो थ्री इज मिसिंग ओकम सोमनी आई एल मेंशन दिस जस्ट नाउ थ्री फोर फाइव सिक्स सेवन मनीष कुमार यादव यू आर एट जीरो वन Uh, 8107 right yes sir okay uh, mohammad azharuddin your 8109 right yes sir okay 10 11 12 13 mrityunjay kumar rana 8114 right yes sir okay it's like one seven so i'm calling out the absentees and the withdrawn 8082 8086 8089 director will want to see that list and possibly there will be a screening list there will be a screening list wherein uh, director will may want a preliminary interview before he puts up may want this is what happened with chevron for the junior batch out of 34 we were required to select 15 so then we went through an interview and believe me that interview was pathetic really really pathetic so horrible i was and frankly feel a little embarrassed to put up those boys for interview they just couldn't talk they just couldn't and they are the best students i don't know what has happened now now we have put up 14 of the best that we got from the 34 and uh, let us see how they do you need to improve your communication skills you need to have a little bit of presentability you need to be able to smile when you are talking most of the fellows were as if they have got a death sentence the look on their face as if they have got a death sentence on them so scared so panicky you can't afford to be so panicky if you are going to be a marine engineer you have to be able to face any odds and come out successfully so have a look on you as being in a little relaxed position be able to smile if the fellow say something funny so that is the way it should be it should be more of a discussion between the interviewer than yourself rather than a question answer session see i'm trying to have an interactive session with you during these classes it sort of you know disarms the person who is being interviewed so you should also let yourself be a little disarmed don't be uptight and so scared that you're going to a jail or something so that should be the attitude and you should be able to talk when he asks you to introduce yourself and i think the first thing you should be able to tell is something about your background do not tell him i am so and so i am kundan kumar he knows you are kundan kumar 
then you tell him i am doing b tech course he knows you are doing b tech course i am in the sixth semester he that he also he knows so don't tell him things that he already knows what is in front of him you tell him about your background where you done your schooling and if at all what are your school experiences what you have achieved in your school and which all places in the country you have been to apart from that then you tell about your family your background in your family what your father is doing he you say my father is a humble farmer my mother is a housewife and i come from a humble background i hope to achieve the highest levels in marine engineering something like that they will fully acknowledge what you are doing what you are saying but you have to tell them something that they don't know and it is an opportunity for you to talk and talk and talk and talk introduce yourself it should be coming to a point where he has to tell you all right now we know a lot about you now let us ask some other question regarding the technical aspect of your knowledge then he should be the one to go on to another part of the subject it should not be that you tell him two three things about your family and then keep quiet and wait for the next question you should be the one to talk endlessly you see in your senior batch there is one by alok kumar singh he is an excellent talker and i was 100% sure he will get into tom and sure enough he got in i had to control him i had to tell him don't overdo it you are capable of talking you are capable of expressing yourself you are capable of discussing very well but there are times you have to be a little careful depending on what the examiner is saying so the question you get from him you'll be able to see him also and the way he is dealing i know based on that you should be able to talk moment he talks you keep shut absolutely shut do not interfere or interrupt when he is talking anyway these are lessons you will only get through through mock interviews and possibly there will be a mock interview in time if director insists on it okay so that will be all for today i have wasted a lot of your time and it is already 11:13 possibly you have to go for your next class so bye bye for now and we hope to see you in the next week stay safe stay very very carefully the covid is stretching like a tsunami okay okay bye bye thank you sir thank you sir thank you sir okay bye bye